Well, good morning. I grew up in a, uh, a conservative home, and so as a result, a lot of things in the world I didn't get exposed to till I was older, including uh, heavy metal and rock music. So for a long time, I had no idea who these guys were. Um, if you're like, who are these guys? This is Metallica. Um, and I discovered who Metallica was not through the radio, but by watching baseball. I played baseball from six all the way through high school. And so I can remember watching uh, the New York Yankees play and their closer, Mariano Rivera, would come out to close the game out and he would come out to Metallica's Enter Sandman song. That's how I learned, you know, who Metallica was. But an interesting thing happened with Metallica, a little bit of trivia, in 2000. In the year 2000, Metallica was preparing a song called I Disappear for the movie Mission Impossible 2. Now, I'm a big Mission Impossible fan. Mission Impossible 2 is like the worst of all the Mission Impossible movies. Um, but they were preparing this song, and they woke up one morning, and they realized that their unfinished song was on the radio. And they're like, how is this on the radio? We haven't even finished it yet. And they discovered that it wasn't just on the radio where they were. It was on the radio all across the country. They went online and they discovered that on a website called Napster, their entire library of songs that they had made in their entire career was available for free. And Metallica was not happy about this. They had worked hard on this to build their art. They had worked hard to, to kind of build up this collection of art that no one was paying for now. They were getting for free. Everyone was downloading it. And so Metallica sued Napster in the year 2000 for $10 million for copyright infringement. And at that time, Metallica's career changed because their fans turned on them. Their fans were angry that they were suing Metallica. Their fans were angry that they, you know, didn't allow them to get the music for free. At that time, Metallica's money was going down, but Sharpie's money was going up. Because everywhere, people were downloading songs, burning them on CDs, and grabbing Sharpies and creating their own art. They were creating playlists for road trips and boyfriends and girlfriends and crushes and friends. And it was during this period that an interesting thing happened. Though it is part of the Big Ten, you know, the Ten Commandments, do not steal. And though none of us would walk into Circle K today and walk out with a Dr. Pepper and a Reese's peanut butter cup and a pack of gum, during this period, for many people, including your lead pastor, it became okay to download music you didn't buy burn it onto CDs that you didn't pay for, and play it for your heart's content. In just a few short years, when it came to music, we decided that it was okay to steal. In his book, Live No Lies, John Mark Comer talks about this radical change in values and goodness. Here's what he says. We now lived in a moral ecosystem where judging your friends for burning CDs was seen as wrong, but stealing was seen as just fine. Right and wrong had been redefined along the lines of popular opinion, or better said, popular desire, and the moral line moved in just a few short years. Now, I tell this story with a little bit of trepidation because I don't want to admit to you publicly just how many songs I downloaded during that period of my life or how many CDs that I made. As the staff was reading through John Mark Comer's book this summer, I was convicted about this because I was like, yeah, that pretty much was stealing. And in his book, Comer uses an analogy of a, a sailor and a sextant. That instrument in his hand is called a sextant, and it's used to guide ships through the seas, guided by the stars. Before there was GPS, sailors like Cook and Magellan, Columbus and Drake would guide their ships literally around the world by the unchanging stars. They, they decided that certain things were absolute and unchanging, and you could trust on them and count on them. But we live in a very different world now. 
Yuval Harari, an atheist philosopher, remarks in this way. He says, in earlier times, it was God who could define goodness, righteousness, and beauty. Today, those answers lie within us. Our feelings give meaning to our private lives, but also to our soul and political processes. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The customer is always right. The voter knows best. If it feels good, do it, and think for yourself. These are some of the main humanist credos. That's how our world operates today. Not by unchanging sources of truth and goodness, but by internal sources of truth goodness, where we become the deciders of what's right and wrong and good and bad. And you can trace it all the way back to a rock band and Napster and some burn CDs. But what's interesting is as we've shifted the source of truth, as we've shifted the unchanging source of goodness, some other things have changed in our culture. Technology has advanced, and yet life is shortened. For the very first time in decades in America, lifespan is shortening. We have more opportunities than ever before, but we also have way more anxiety and depression. Especially for young people, in the last 10 years, anxiety and depression have gone off the charts. And while we have massive information and connection tools, we also have unprecedented loneliness, isolation, and animosity. I mean, everything is supposed to be getting better, right? We're smarter, we're more advanced, we have more technology, and yet we're more unhappier, we hate each other more, we're more isolated. And you're like, Scott, what does this have to do with the fruit of the Spirit? Well, I believe the fruit of the Spirit actually speaks to our world's deep needs. In a world of isolation and loneliness and animosity, we are a world in deep need of love. In a world that has made happiness the highest value, we are in deep need of lasting joy. In a world where it seems like everyone is fighting over everything, we're a people in deep need of peace. In a world that forms us into impatience and greed, we're a people in deep need of patience. As we saw last week, in a world of harshness and canceling, we're a people and a time in deep, deep need of kindness. And I ask the question, what if the fruit of the Spirit were actually answers to the great needs of our world? And we've been in a series this summer looking at these fruit, and I would argue today that the fruit that God wants to birth in us actually match the deep needs and questions our world is asking. So today what we're going to talk about is a world in need of the goodness of God. When we read the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5, the Greek word that's translated into goodness is the word agathosune. And it means benevolent or active goodness. Not just being good in terms of who you are, but doing good. It isn't just having a concept of goodness, it's actuating that concept into action. An author of one of the Bible dictionaries I read talked about the difference between goodness and last week's definition of kindness. He said there is more activity in goodness than there is in kindness. Goodness, though, does not spare sharpness and rebuke to cause good in others. A person may display his goodness, his zeal for goodness and truth in rebuking, correcting, or chastising. So if you were here last week and you're like, Scott, all you're talking about is being kind to people, never really telling them anything hard. I told you to come back this week. So here you are. Kindness and goodness go together and they form a full picture. And there's a reason that they're next to each other in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So here's the big idea we're going to tackle today if you're taking notes. God uses people with attitudes of kindness and actions of goodness. God uses people with attitudes of kindness and actions of goodness. Now today, I'm not going to ask you to define from within yourself what is goodness. We're going to turn to the scriptures for our source of truth about goodness, and there's four truths about goodness I want to share with you today. And here's the first one. 
Goodness is God's nature. And through Christ, goodness becomes our nature too. Goodness is God's nature. It's not our nature. But through Christ, goodness can become our nature too. So if you have your Bible this morning, I want to invite you to open up to the book of Titus, chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus is one page in my Bible. It's very short. It's after 1 and 2 Timothy. It's before the book of Philemon. And near the end of his life, Paul wrote letters to these young men that he had been mentoring, Timothy and Titus. And he spoke to them rather urgently about their opportunity to lead in the church after he was gone. And I want to invite you to stand with me as we read from Titus 3 this morning, verses 4 through 8. If you don't have a Bible, just watch the screens. Here's what Paul says. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that you who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. Heavenly Father, I pray that in a world that is shifting its definition of goodness, I pray we might find ourselves firmly planted in yours. Not goodness of our own, but goodness that comes from you. And as our Bibles are open today, our hearts would be to Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. You can be seated. What Paul is saying to Timothy is that we are not in ourselves good. Goodness is God's nature, but it requires the death of Jesus, our repentance, and our receiving of his grace and mercy for us to become good. As the point said, goodness is God's nature and it becomes our nature through Christ. And though we live in a world that says, hey, basically, fundamentally, we're all good— and we will go to heaven one day because we're good. That's just popular American theology. What Paul is saying here to Timothy is that God saved us. <laughs> There's a reason we needed saving, because we weren't good. And yet when we receive his goodness and his mercy, it changes our nature and then we become empowered to do good works. If you go back to even the teaching of Jesus, Jesus was talking about the fact that we aren't made good from what we do from the outside in. No, we are made good from the inside out. And it's what's inside a person that matters. In Luke 6, Jesus says, A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart." So if you're like me and you've said or you've heard somebody said, I don't know what came over me, or I don't know what came out of me, or I don't know where that came from, Jesus knows. It came from your heart. Now, you may not like what's in your heart. You may not want to face what's in your heart. You may be shocked by the state of your heart. But what comes out of you every day is what is in your heart. And if we get honest with each other, every day, we have to reckon with the fact that our nature in our heart is not good on its own. Because stuff comes out of us all the time that is not good. 
Christopher Wright says this about this passage. He says, goodness comes from the life of God within us. What Jesus did came from who Jesus was in his own heart and mind and motives. Goodness is a heart thing. It comes from the inside, and what we are on the inside is like fruit. And fruit is the evidence of what's going on inside the nature of the tree itself. So the fruit of our lives is all a reflection of what's going on inside of us. And that's why again and again, Paul here in Timothy and all throughout the scriptures remind us that we live in a world that's obsessed with appearance. But God is obsessed with your heart. And occasionally, you and I will run into people whose stuff is coming out of them that's incredible. It's beautiful fruit. And the closer you get to them, the more consistent they become. And we have a word for this in our culture. It's actually an acronym. W-Y-S-W-Y-G. What you see is what you get. Don't you love people like this? I love people like this who the closer I get to them, the more consistent I see. The, the opposite is true. You and I know people who from me to the back of the room look great. But if I was to hop down off the stage and walk to the back of the room, I would start cringing. Because what you see is not what you get with them. We have words for this. Hypocrites, fake, posers. They're not what you see is what you get. And God's desire for us is that by receiving his goodness and his nature becoming our nature, we would become good, that we would become people who what you see is what you get. And that really has been the heartbeat of this series. The big idea of this series is this, that the fruit of the Spirit are not objectives we achieve, but they're outcomes we experience. The only way that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control will come out of our lives is if God's goodness takes residence within our hearts and begins to make our hearts good, that out of that heart, goodness would flow. So I'm not here today to tell you to will yourself into goodness. I'm here to tell you today that you need to receive the goodness of God for you to become good and for him to birth goodness through you. Because goodness is incredibly important to God. Number two, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Goodness is not only in this list of the fruit of the Spirit, it's part of God's purposes for your life and for mine. If you still have Titus 3 open, go back to verse 8. In verse 8, he says, This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. What is the purpose of your life now that you've experienced the goodness of God? It is to do good works. Earlier in the book of Ephesians, here's what Paul said there. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Really clear here, Ephesians 2. Christianity does not teach that you are saved by your good works. That you go to heaven because you're a good person. None of us are fundamentally good. And and we're not saved by our works. So there really should be no place for arrogant Christians because the reason you got saved had nothing to do with you. The only thing you brought to that equation was your brokenness and your opposite of goodness. But Paul doesn't finish there. He says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Now, sometimes when we talk about good works, we get uncomfortable in the church. And, and, and throughout the history of the church, there is a pattern that, that follows 
by decades or quarter centuries or half centuries or centuries. Though Christianity started in the Middle East and then moved to Europe, and now it's in America and around the world, there is a pattern in our history of our faith that's like a pendulum that swings back and forth. And throughout history, and even throughout the history of Christianity in America, there is this pendulum swing between an emphasis on the gospel and grace and an emphasis on good works. And maybe you grew up in a church or grew up in a time that was very focused on the gospel, sharing the gospel, people becoming saved, being baptized. Or maybe you grew up in a church or in a family that was very focused on good works, serving, making a difference. But what happens is historically, we tend to go like this and like this and like this and like this. So if you grew up in an environment that was very gospel focused, this message may make you uncomfortable because I'm emphasizing good works. And you're like, Scott, good works don't save you. I know. But we were created to do them. And God has prepared them in advance for us, for us to do. And if you're like, Scott, we really need to get involved. We need to make a difference. There's lots of stuff broken in our world. We need to do that. I know. I hear you. But we're not saved by those things. We're saved by God's grace. And we're not saved by our works, but we are saved to do them. And over time, I encourage you to discover which one of those places do you typically swing the pendulum to and pay attention that you don't abandon the other because they are to be held together in balance. The truth is, good works testify to the goodness of God and his power over evil. We don't just do good works because there are needs in our community or we care about people. When we do good works, they testify to the goodness of God and they show that he is at work in the midst of an evil world and they point people to him. They are not an end to themselves. Okay, third thing. Submitting to God's word forms us into goodness. So if we receive God's goodness in our hearts, he has to go to work to begin forming us. You know this, if you're a follower of Jesus, you received him, you put your faith in him, you experienced your grace, and you didn't wake up the next morning with all of your issues gone. The next morning, you didn't wake up and the project was completed. No, it's a lifelong project. And how does God work his goodness into our heart? He does it through his word. 2 Timothy 3, Paul's letter, one page before, if you're still in Titus, go one page before 2 Timothy 3, letter to another mentee. Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every what? good work. That's the purpose of God's word in our lives, that we would be transformed, that we would be formed into the kind of people who can do the good works that God has called us to, and that happens as we submit to his word. The challenge is, is that there are some very real obstacles in our way. And I think about these obstacles a little bit like I think about the TV show American Ninja Warrior. Have seen this show before? I mean, these people who can go and navigate these obstacles are incredible. One of them is actually a part of our church. Dr. John Bundy, who's head of our missions team, if you may not know this, he is a two-time contestant on American Ninja Warrior. He competed in 2019, got washed out in 2020 because they canceled those, and he came back in 2021, and I was in Nashville last summer in a hotel room watching my buddy, and that picture on the right here where John is doing a little bit of like a, uh, a guttural prehistoric scream is, uh, is him kind of making it through the first wave of obstacles. Now, I, I was trying to find the video of John doing this online, and it would have required me to steal a video from YouTube. And since I already told you not to steal music, <laughs> you're just going to have to trust me that it was an amazing moment. 
But as I think about the obstacles that John and those contestants overcome, I think about the two obstacles that you and I have to submitting to God's word. And the first one is the values of this world. The values of our world, as they have formed us, become an obstacle to us submitting to God's word. Because there are some fundamental values in our world today that the Bible will begin to bump up against, such as these. These questions that we ask ourselves, well, is it fun? Is it easy? And does it make me happy? I mean, these are fundamental questions that people ask on a daily basis about what they're going to do or not do. Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be easy? Am I going to be happy doing it? And there are going to be a number of times as you read God's word where the answer to all of these questions will be the same. No. No, it's not going to be necessarily fun. No, it's certainly not going to be easy. No, in the moment, your primary experience is not going to be happy. And that's why many times we, we kind of pull away from Scripture because it's bumping up against the values we may not profess, but are, which are actually forming in our heart. And I love what Beth Moore says about this. She says, does God's word always tell you what you want to hear? Are his words to you always pleasant? Do you always welcome them with open ears? Surely not. Yet, have you ever found his word misleading? Has he ever tried to harm you with his word? Certainly not. God's word is always for the purpose of bringing good. And just like God, his word prioritizes goodness over gladness because God knows that goodness ultimately brings gladness. If you make your happiness, your gladness, the ultimate value where you have to be happy and glad all the time, you will certainly miss the good works that God has for you. But if you recognize that gladness or happiness is an outcome of a certain kind of life with God, you will begin to discover him forming you. The other obstacle, in addition to the values of this world, is the state of our hearts. It's often not the, the problems out there that keep me from trusting God's word. It's often the stuff in here. And if you've been sitting here today and you're like, Scott, yep, we live in this world and it's compromised, and you tell them, if you've been sitting here writing down the people you're going to send this sermon to when it's over, friend, I'm not saying you shouldn't send them this sermon. I'm just saying you should listen to the whole thing yourself first. And before you make it about what they need to hear, you need to make sure what God is saying to you first. Because often the state of our hearts reveal that we think the problems are out there when we're ignoring the stuff in here. Again, Beth Moore teaches us on this front too. She says, we cannot be trusted to do the good works until the word of God does its good work in us. If we cannot accept the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training of God's word in our own lives— then we cannot be the vessels of teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in others' lives. If you love being the person who lets them have it for where they're wrong, and no one gets to do that for you, if you're always the voice of rebuking, correcting, and training, and there's no one in your life who you've empowered to do the same, friend, you are on dangerous ground. Because God wants to do that same work in you. And he wants to form you through his word. Finally, number four, we live in a time where goodness will be opposed. Now, this section is going to be what I'm calling the lightning round. That's A, so I don't get stuck in any of these, and B, so you don't freak out because I'm going so fast. It's intended to go fast. So, if you buckle your seatbelts like Jake did here on the bike, we'll take off. Letter A, goodness is absent within hearts. 
Goodness is absent within hearts today, and goodness has always been absent in hearts on earth. Flagrant sin is not a 21st century problem. If you don't know, just read the Bible. There are some grade A sinners in this book. Going back to the book of Psalms, David is one of them. He says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Paul, who was a terrorist before he became an evangelist, said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So today, goodness is absent in hearts, and goodness has always been absent in hearts. B, there are those who call evil good and good evil. In the day of the Bible and the day of today, there are people who are switching around these and calling one the other and the other the other. In Isaiah, the prophet says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so if you're watching the news or you're scrolling social media and like, Scott, there are people who are taking what is good and they're calling it evil, and people who are taking what is evil and they're holding it up as good. Yes, that is happening. It is terrible. It is also not new. Letter C. Doing good can have a cost. If you're going to do the good that God has prepared you to do, that he's called you to do, there's going to be a cost to it. Psalm 15. The writer says, Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. Sometimes doing what you've said you're going to do, what God has called you to do, is going to hurt. And that's why God's word runs counter to the ways of this world. Because if doing goodness hurts and you say, is it easy, fun, and happy, only one of those can win. Letter D, doing good can be exhausting. Like when you're doing what God's called you to do, what's good, it, it's exhausting. Whoever said you find what God created you to do and you never work a day in your life lied. Just after the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and Galatians 6, Paul says, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Why does he have to say this? Because we're tempted to give up, and we easily become tired. So don't use I'm tired as a sign that you're doing something wrong. Doing good can be exhausting. Letter E. Be like doves and snakes, kind and good. Most of the time in sermons, you don't hear a message, be like a snake. But Jesus once said that, Matthew 10. Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Yes, we're called to be kind, but we're also called to be wise and shrewd. And all too often, we're only one and not the other. So I don't want any of you to say, man, Scott, you're really a snake today. I'm not sure I'd want that compliment. But there's a truth within that that we're called to be. And then finally, letter F, remember our fight is not against people. It's for people. We have an enemy in this world, and that enemy is not people. Right before his description of the armor of God in Ephesians 6, Paul says this. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And so when you go online this week and you're tempted to pick a fight in the comments, I just want to encourage you those people on the other side of the other computers that are talking there, they are not your enemy. Because your enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is the one who has taken them captive with deceptive ideas. 
And all too often, we treat the people for whom Jesus died as the enemy. They are not the enemy. We do have an enemy, though, and they are not it. And what God is going to do, my full confidence is this. God is going to use people like you with attitudes of kindness and actions of goodness. So let's talk about how. How is that going to happen? Some next steps, some practices for you this morning and this week. Number one, ask God, where, God, have I developed a standard of goodness apart from you? That Yuval Harari quote at the beginning, the customer is always right. Do what feels good. Trust yourself. We are just as susceptible to believing those lies as the people around us. So this week, when it comes to what you're thinking is good, I want you to pause and ask God, God, where have I developed my own standard of goodness that doesn't have its origin in you? Because you're just as vulnerable to that temptation as the person who lives next to you who's not a follower of Jesus. Number two, ask yourself, who have I empowered to rebuke me? And where am I resisting the Holy Spirit's prompts to correct someone I love? In the same way that we had the gospel and the good works kind of pendulum, some of us are really good at rebuking other people. You're like an A-plus rebuker. Who gets to rebuke you? Who gets to rebuke you? The most dangerous person in the world is the person who can rebuke but cannot be rebuked. On the other side, some of you are kind of D plus rebukers. It makes you really uncomfortable to tell somebody something hard. And you may feel conviction about that in your heart right now. And you're like, please God, convict somebody else. but in the same way you've received it from somebody else and been benefited and blessed by it, you need to do the same. He not only calls us to be kind, he calls us to be good. And then number three, when it comes to what you feed your mind this week, I want you to embrace the Philippians 4.8 standard. What does Philippians 4.8 tell us? What we focus our mind on. And so this week, I want you to ask yourself a question. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Now, you're going to see a lot of stuff this week if you have a phone or you turn on your TV that is not these things. If you're just around people, you're going to see stuff that is not these things. So I'm not saying just go la 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 and cover your eyes and, you know, ignore the world. But a lot of us forget that we have a choice with what we fill our mind with. What are you going to watch when you turn on your TV? Who are you going to follow online? What are you going to read when you pick up a book or a magazine? What are you going to download on your iPhone or your iPad? And if it's not true, if it's not noble, if it's not right, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, it's not admirable, I would encourage you, don't feed your mind with it. So here's the question. If the answer to those things is yes, then feed your mind with it. If the answer is no, then rid your mind of it. Because you are like a tree. And we often get focused on the fruit, but we forget the soil. And the soil is what you fill your mind with. And if you want God to birth fruits of goodness out of you as a tree, and you're constantly filling the soil with the opposite of goodness, you're forgetting how nature works. You can't control the fruit, but you can sift the soil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it can form us to be people that we are not naturally. And so today we confess that there is plenty in our life today that is not good. And the goodness that is there, it didn't come from us, it came from you. So in a world that is redefining what is good, in a world that's changing its basis of direction from you to self, we pray 
that we would remain vigilant to that very temptation in our own hearts. We pray that you would make our hearts good, that your nature would be our nature. And out of the goodness that you're bringing to life in our hearts, goodness would come out of our life. We would not be here if it was not for your goodness to us. And we pray that we would step into and live out the good works that you've planned for us long ago. In your name we pray, amen.